We are continuing the series of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. Our senior pastor has been leading us through a series on Psalm 23. And so I'll be continuing with Psalm 23, verse 4. Put it down. Down. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Technical difficulties. There we go. <laughs> I. You all right? Got you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you know I'll be running all around, I probably would have hit something. <laughs> I probably would have hit something. So I'll be coming in from Psalms 23, verse 4. And are there any children in the audience? Can children make some noise? Okay, all right, all right. Can, children, can y'all make some noise again? Oh, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, okay, I, I have been, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this, but before I start, I'm going to see if y'all can say what it do Q for me, and uh, we're going to get into this message. I said, hold on, let me see if some children are here. And some adults of all ages, children of all, of all ages. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see what happens. We're going to get some, a little energy here. It's going to be a great message. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. But first, I'm going to read um, the scripture. Re read the scripture. It's from Psalms 23, Psalm 23, verse 4. Psalm 23, verse 4. You can stand up for the reading. Psalm 23, verse 4, it's the NIV. NIV verse, and it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, mercy, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let me say that again. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You can all be seated. My sermon in a sentence, my sermon in a sentence is this. If you just so happen to fall asleep, go to sleep, or go for a 30-minute restroom break, if that so happens, I got you. I got you. I got you. I call it a sermon in a sentence. That means if you go to work, Later on in this upcoming week, and they say, yo, you went to church this past weekend, right? What, what was the sermon about? You don't have to say, oh, turn around and run away. I got you. I got you. The sermon in the sentence is this. It's basically a prayer. It says, Lord, sometimes I don't understand your way, but I'll stay. Lord, sometimes I don't understand your way but I'll stay. For my children, I love how y'all hype your boy up, so I'm about to step out again. I'm finna see if y'all ready to say what it do Q one more time. I don't know how many times I can do this for pastor be like, hold on for a second. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna step out <laughs> one more time and we gonna get this sermon started. All right. Now y'all gotta, gotta say it with y'all chest this time too. With y'all chest. What? Oh, oh, look, that was good. That's a good energy. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Once again, the sermon in the sentence is, Lord, sometimes I don't understand your way, but I'll stay. The title of this message is, Don't Knock the Rocks. Don't Knock the Rocks. Let's pray. Lord, speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't knock the rocks. Sermon's going to deal with a, with, with a couple of rocks since you guys see some rocks on the stage. I lived in Virginia for almost, in a few weeks, it would be about two weeks. I mean, two months, two months, not two weeks. Two months. I was about to say, I ain't want to lie while I'm on the stage. Mercy. Two months. 
almost two months. In a few, in a few more weeks, like a week and a week and a half, I'll be here for two months. And I, and I want to start this sermon already with an apology. I apologize for not listening to you all when y'all told me about Virginia traffic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't listen to y'all when y'all said not to leave the house between three and seven if I can. I'm sorry that I didn't listen to y'all when y'all said don't go to D.C. during rush hour. I live in Arlington, and what was an 18-minute ride to D.C. turns into 45 minutes. That's evil. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't listen to y'all when y'all said Virginia has some interesting drivers in the most Christian way possible. We started. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> they said the truth. Terrible. <laughs> I am so sorry that I didn't listen to you guys. And, and, and basically, when, a little bit of it is me not being not listening to directions when driving. I'm not necessarily the best when it comes to listening to directions when driving. If there's anybody that I want to really apologize to, though, it's my GPS. <laughs> Apple Maps, Waze, all of them. See, Apple Maps does this thing. Apple Maps does this thing where it shows you, the, it shows you your route, but it also shows you the fastest route, right? It shows you the fastest route. Now, me, I am a diehard Virginia resident after almost two months. Yes sir. yes, sir. Almost after two months. So if it tells me this is the fastest way, I don't believe that. And so I go my own way, the way that I learned like a couple of weeks. And Apple Maps is so patient. It's so kind. It's so long-suffering. It just says redirect. Redirect, 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 but I still stay on my own way. And eventually, I bump into traffic. It's at that moment that me and Apple Maps are just silent in the car. <laughs> she knows that I was wrong. And she's, she's very patient. Psalms 23, Psalm 23 is the story of the good shepherd and how he leads us into places that we would sometimes want to avoid. The whole setting of Psalm 23 is something that we need to have sink in our minds. I recently listened to a speaker a few years, a few years ago, I listened to a speaker describe the actual terrain of the green pastures spoken of in Psalms. Now, this text, it starts off in the valley. David says, in the, even in the darkest valley. We need to understand exactly what this valley is really looking like. Now, at first I thought that it looked like the traditional sense of the regular pastures, that, that, that the green, the plush, the grass. And then the speaker said that it doesn't. He said that that's a complete lie. Actually, it looks, it looks a little... Deserty. It looks a little messed up, a little mangled, a little mangled. Oh, yes. Oh, mercy. Help me. Somebody say mercy. <laughs> he described the area as dry, almost barren and, barren and not appealing. Totally different from the pictures that I'm used to seeing at my great grandma's house. It doesn't have the plush and vibrant green grass that every, that for everywhere for the sheep to graze. Immediately, I put my world-renowned researching abilities to use. And I had to use the number one resource that I knew would never steer me wrong, Google. <laughs> and I looked at it and I saw those pictures. I saw those pictures. Now, this is a very interesting situation because now sheep, they have to dance around and walk around a lot of rocks. They have, to, they have to deal with different predators that are native to that desert-like area, like snakes and coyotes and stray dogs. This is very interesting because now the shepherd has to guide the sheep around rocks in order to find grass. This is because there's little to no grass because there's little to no water that's actually coming to the soil. No rain, little to no rainfall. So this is interesting to know that a shepherd has to guide the sheep to the grass. 
around rocks. But I want, I want to do something for a second. We know that there's grass around the rocks, but think about it from the perspective of a small sheep. A small sheep. Is there any way we can get some video to, to, to bring me in lower in sheep, sheep mode right here? Am I, am I low? All right. All right, everybody, y'all see me? Y'all still see me? Awesome. Sheep from this area, from this angle, all they see are rocks. From the angle of a shepherd, they already know the terrain. They're tall. They already know the terrain. They're skilled. They already know what's going to be around. They know the grass. They know the nourishment that is around. But for a sheep, for sheep, they just see the rocks and they have to trust, they have to trust that the shepherd is good, that the good shepherd would lead them to an area that is full of nourishment. Now, let me tell you guys this. For sheep, if they see rocks, rocks don't look appetizing. Rocks don't look ideal. Rocks do not look like a tasty snack or a tasty meal. And so they have to trust this good shepherd to know that even though the shepherd is leading them to something that they really don't like, the shepherd has something for them beyond the rocks. Something that they can eat beyond the rocks. See, at first the shepherd really can't see anything. The sheep can't really see anything. All they see is rocks. But the good shepherd knows there is something beyond the rocks. Now, this is important because David is actually talking. He's, he's talking about this area, and it's something that really connects with us. Many times we are trying to allow God to lead us, and God is leading us to places that just look like rocks. And we're like, what is this? This is not what I planned for. This doesn't look the way I would have liked it to look, and I have to give myself this prayer. I have to give myself this, this, this prayer to God, and it is simply this. God, do not allow my preference to block me from your promise. Because if I'm not careful, I can miss out on God's goodness because it doesn't look the way I want. It doesn't work out the way I want it. It's not according to the plan that I have in mind. Don't knock the rocks in your life. Amen. There's many rocks, many things that don't look appetizing to us that God sends us in our lives. And during those times, we want to reject them. But God has us in those areas so it can nurture us and grow us and build us. Amen. I remember when I first went, came back to St. Louis for my first semester of Oakwood University. Before then, I worked at the YMCA as a fitness instructor. Now, I know, I, you know, I don't. <laughs> no comment. Just talk to me about it afterwards. I don't know how it worked. I don't know how it happened out. I don't know how it worked out, but I was, I was a fitness instructor. I helped people out with workouts and all that kind of stuff. I was a fitness instructor. I don't know how they hired me, but it was an awesome job. My friends got free access to the basketball court, all kinds of stuff. I was, I was the man on the streets. I was the plug. I had it all. They was like, Q, you work at a great place at, at YMCA. It was awesome. It was awesome. I met different celebrities and everything. And so when I went to Oakwood, they said, look, if you come back during the summer, we got you. You can come back on the team. So I was like, oh, all right, great. I come back from college after the first semester, and I come to YMCA, and I say, yo, I am ready for that job. I want to be a fitness instructor again for the summer. This is about to be nice. And they say, um, we said you can come back to the team, but we didn't tell you what you was going to be doing. And I was like, yo, I'm down for whatever. What y'all want me to do? I can, I can be a lifeguard. I can't swim, but, you know, I can do. <laughs> they was like, well, you won't be doing fitness instructing, but you'll be cleaning the restrooms and toilets. Oh. That's, that's why I said, I just said, oh, because I was, I didn't have nothing else to say. I just said, oh, you know. 
as a young man just coming from college, you don't want to hear that you're going to be cleaning restrooms and toilets throughout the rest of your summer. And at first, I was a little timid about it. As a matter of fact, I started working there, and I went to college a little later in my years, and so some of my friends, many by that time, they had already graduated. So some of them, they had already graduated. They were already working for companies, and they would come to the YMCA. And I was like, no, sir, I ain't having no part today. I'll be hiding, all kinds of stuff. I'll just be hiding around. They wouldn't be able to find me. I was embarrassed at first. But then I realized that God brings us close to the rocks to show us how he can bless us and increase us. When I worked there that summer, it was some of the most fulfilling work that I ever did. It taught me how to truly serve people. It taught me how the little, the little groups and the little departments actually move large organizations. It taught me how to care for people sometimes who are difficult to care for. Somebody came in upset one day. I knew that they, well, they, they just weren't upset. They just needed some towels. And I was good at the towels. I was, I was folding those things. I had fresh, warm towels for you. I was a towel master. I had it for them. And I realized that God used that time that didn't look so well and appealing to me so that he can grow me. Some of those skills I am still using to this day. And it's all because I did not knock the rocks. God has blessings and things that don't look, may, may not look like what we want. But he's bringing us through it because he's the good shepherd and he knows what's best for us. The valley that David talks about, the valley that David talks about is daunting. As a matter of fact, in the scripture says the darkest valley or the, the, the valley of the shadow of death. These are very hard things to hear. The valley is so connected to difficulty and hurt and pain, yet to a shepherd, the valley is actually the best part for watering. You have a great water supply in the valley. As a matter of fact, if some sheep do not go, if some groups of sheep do not go through valleys, they may not be able to have the sustenance so they can walk up to the mountaintop. So for many sheep, they need the valley in order to survive on the mountaintop. And there are some valleys that God is requiring you to go because he knows if you don't go through that valley, you won't make it one day on the mountaintop. That's why some of us, that rejection of that job built up resilience in us. That ended relationship showed us more about ourselves. God uses the valley so that we may be able to be sustainable at the mountaintop. He says, even though I walk through the darkest valley. The second point. Second point, the next key that David gives us in Psalm 23, 4, is through this statement, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Hold up, David. Hold up. How are you going to say you will have no fear? You just got through calling this thing the darkest valley. We already know that this isn't no playground that, that, that David is on. This is no playground. This is a deserted area that has many dangerous animals around it. David, how can you say that this area, you don't have no fear in this area? You don't, you, you don't, you're, you're not scared in such a terrain. You're not scared in such an environment. And David would say, this is why. Because he's with me. Amen. The good shepherd is with me. Amen. David in Psalm 23, 4, he doesn't point to his skill. He doesn't point to the fact that he's a cool sheep. He doesn't point to the fact that he's dope. He doesn't point to the fact that he's really good at what he does. No, he doesn't point to his proficiency, but he points to his proximity. Amen. He says, it's not about my skill, but it's about who I am with. Have your confidence ever went up because you was with someone? Because of who you was with? I remember in fourth grade, I had a bully. Now, hold, on, hold on for a second. Y'all know I'm a visual person. Y'all know I'm a visual person. So I'm going to need my bullies to come up. My, my bullies. And, in fourth grade, I had, I had bullies. And one of their names was Prentice. 
I'm sorry if you hear this, Prentice. I love you. But one of his name was Prentice. And Prentice would talk about me all the time. He would laugh about me, talk about my shoes, talk about everything. He would dog me out. And one day, Prentice said, Man, tomorrow after school, I'm going to crack your skull. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> crack the skull? That, was, that wasn't in the script. That was... Get a, the, <laughs> the, Prince, he said, he said, <laughs> that's, that's very creative. The, he says, the next day, now this is, now this is, this is important, y'all. This is, this is important. He says the next day, he didn't, he's a good planner because he didn't even say today. He, now I am scared, not only later on that day, but the entire day until the end of school the next day. So I am stressed. Prentice is going to beat me up. Prentice is going to beat me up. This is what's going to happen. This bully is going to beat me up. His group, his gang, they're, they're deep. They're ready to get me. They're ready to knock me out. And I remember talking to my family members about it, being back home, talking with my cousin about it and everything like that. And the day came. I went, I went to school and all I could think about was Prentice. I was scared the entire time. I was thinking about how he talks about me, how he, how he has his entourage with him. Even the chicken nuggets I was getting at lunch that looked like Prentice's head. It was shaped. I was thinking about Prentice all the time. And then we got into the bus, y'all. We got into the bus, and the day was coming. The bus stopped at my house, and... Everybody was there. People was in the bus. They were waiting. It seemed like people in the neighborhood, they heard about the fight. I don't know how that worked. <laughs> they were waiting. It, and I saw Prentice, and I just, <sighs> I just did the best thing I could do. I just said, look, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk home. And as I walked home, I had my head down. <laughs> and then I noticed, I noticed Prentice and his boys started running away. And I looked up. It was my cousin. <laughs> Come to find out, he overheard me when I was talking about Prentice the other night. And so he came down the street. Now, I'm going to tell y'all this. When I saw my cousin walk down the street, I wasn't scared anymore. I acted brand new. I said, Princess, man, y'all ain't going to never do me like this. Y'all ain't going to never hold me back. Hold me back. Y'all ain't going to never. Y'all ain't going to never get me like this. <laughs> Give it up for my bullies. Oh, sorry. oh I get that. <laughs> Give it up for my cousin. <laughs> and David is saying, David is saying, the same thing. Those are visuals, but David is saying the same thing. He's saying, because I know who I'm with, I can act brand new in the face of danger. Because I know who I'm with, I can be unbothered in the face of stress. Knowing who you with, adjust the blessing that you're in. What do I mean by that? In John 11, Martha is at Lazarus' funeral. He's at Lazarus' funeral, and Jesus steps up. Jesus steps up, and, and, and Jesus says, your brother will be risen. Your brother will rise. And Martha says, yo, I, I, I know, I know he's going to rise at, at, at the last day. And Jesus had to say, no, you got it all twisted. It, you, you think that my blessing is an event. You're actually standing in front of the blessing. That's right. That's right. Because, because I'm not just giving out resurrections. I am the resurrection. I'm not just giving folks peace. I am the prince of peace. I'm not just loving on folks. No, I am love. The awesomeness of the gospel is this, is that a son came down here, a child came down here, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And it means this, as long as God is with us, his blessings aren't contingent upon our environment. That means God is joy in the massage parlor and in the prison. God is our peace when we have the perfect job or in a crazy work environment. God is gracious to us when we are our relationship goals or when we're on the brink of divorce. God, devil, David says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And it doesn't matter my situation. I know as long as I have you, 
I'm with the right person. I'm with the good shepherd. David says, look, even though I walk, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. This is the final point. The verse ends with David saying that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now get this, the rod and the staff, the rod and the staff, they're two different instruments and they both serve the sheep but in different ways. We've already heard that, that that David can be blessed through the valleys. We've already heard that he doesn't have any fear as long as he's with God, as long as he's with the good shepherd. But his last statement is powerful. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David, why does your rod, the rod and the staff comfort you? Once again, the rod and the staff both serve the sheep, but for two different reasons. The rod was a short club-like wooden instrument that many shepherds used ever since they were children, practicing, throwing, throwing the club, throwing the rod at different targets for speed and accuracy. They used the rod to defend themselves from external threats. In a place in a deserted area, they used the rod to protect themselves and the sheep from different predators like coyotes, wolves, cougars, snakes, or stray dogs. And if I had the time, I would praise God for the fact that there were some threats that wanted to end me, but God knocked them out. Is there anyone here that knows that there were some wolves that wanted to devour you? That there were some snakes that wanted to ruin you? That there were some stray dogs that wanted to sneak their way into your life, but God knocked them out? There were some issues that the enemy designed to eliminate you and steal your joy, but because of God's power, God blocked it. The rod, the rod saved the sheep from external threats. But the staff, the staff served another purpose. The staff was a long and slender stick with a hook at the top, and it was used for gathering and collecting and guiding the sheep. However, the shepherd, the pastor that was a shepherd, Philip Keller, he says in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalms 23, he says there's another specific use for the staff. See, many sheep are foodies. Many sheep love food. But they're also stubborn. And in their quest for getting food, they will go into the most dangerous predicaments. There are stories of sheep actually climbing up steep hills for some food, falling off the hill and falling into the sea. And so the shepherd uses the staff to get the sheep from the sea to back to land. There are stories of sheep being tangled up in rose bushes because they were looking for some grass to eat. And the only thing that the only way they can make it out was through the shepherd's staff. The, she- the shepherd used the staff to get the sheep out of traps that it got itself into. And this is the point. This is the point. The rod was used to protect the sheep from other threats, but the staff was used to protect the sheep from himself. And I rejoice in the fact that God will protect me from outside threats, but today I also praise him because he knows my proclivities. He knows my hangups. He knows my stubbornness. He knows my triggers, and he will save me from the traps that I often get myself into because I think I know the right way. It was me that got myself into that unhealthy relationship and God had to pull me out of that mess. It was me that made the poor financial decision. God kept redirecting, redirecting all the way. And now he's saving me from the ramifications of that decision. It was me that got triggered and said that hurtful thing to my friend. And now God is repairing the friendship. Story after story in the Bible, it testifies of the fact that we get ourselves in traps, but God rescues us. Moses kills the Egyptian guard and goes to the wilderness, but God saves. Jacob deceives his father and his brother, but God saves. Samson tells Delilah the secret to his strength, but God saves. Peter denies Christ three times, but God saves. And I know that sometimes we want to focus on how God can eliminate our enemies, how God can eliminate our haters. But truth be told, if we praise God for only doing that, we will only be praising him for doing half of his job. 
The reality is sometimes I do more damage to myself than my enemies. And if that's you, and you have been your own worst enemy, I'm here to encourage you that God saves. Because his rod and his staff, they comfort us. Because God doesn't only protect us from our enemies, but he protects us from our enemy. We can begin to play. David wrote Psalm 23. And I could only help but imagine that he was thinking about this psalm in Chronicles, in First Chronicles, when he messed up. See, God had given him a certain direction, but he didn't listen. And God kept on being patient with him, but he just kept on going his own way. God kept on saying, redirect, redirect, redirect. But now David makes this mistake. And as he makes the mistake, he's given the choice, two ways to get his punishment. He can either have punishment at the hands of his enemies, or have punishment at the hands of God. And I can't, I can't help but think that possibly David was thinking about this song when he said, allow me to be punished by God. Because his next phrase is amazing. He says, because his mercy is so great. Lord, sometimes I don't understand your way, but I'll stay. I don't know what aspect in your life in which you just don't understand how God is moving. You may be seeing a rock in your life. You're like, look, I don't want this. You may need to take some time to pray to God and ask God, look, how are you trying to teach me with this situation? God may be talking with you while you're going through your your issue and while you're going through your trial and saying, look, I want you to remind yourself of how good I am so you won't have fear because I'm with you. Or you may be in the situation in which God is just not protecting you from your enemies, but he's protecting you from yourself. Because at times we can be self-destructive. Lord, sometimes I don't understand your way, but I'll stay. I don't know where you are at in your life, but if you need prayer, I ask that you pray with me during this time as I pray. If you are in a situation in which you don't you don't understand what God's doing in your life right now and you need to feel the good shepherd I ask for you to pray with me let's pray dear Heavenly Father Lord God Lord God we come before you God, and we thank you so much for being the good shepherd. The fact of the matter is, Lord God, we're going through valleys and we're just seeing them as difficult paths and difficult roads, God. Allow us to change our perspective and see them for what they really are, God. Allow us to see the nourishment, God. Lord God, we ask that you please remind us of how great you are, God. And as we're reminded of how great you are, we will have no fear in the midst of what we're going through at times. But I also ask, Lord God, that you allow us to focus on the fact that sometimes what we go through is not only protecting us from our enemies, but for protecting us from ourselves. Show us the things we need to do work on, Lord God, so that we can be better human beings and better followers of you. Lord God, sometimes we don't understand the way, but we'll stay. We'll keep on allowing you to lead us. We pray these things in your name.